The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's a priest member of the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine time. Yourself? Doing well, Father. Thanks for being here. Certainly. Father, on a recent program, we discussed this topic of Catholic education. And uh, in that program, Father, we dealt primarily with the grade school levels. So tonight I would like to continue that discussion in uh, regards to the Catholic perspective on uh, the higher education and and colleges and universities and the the post-secondary education. So, uh, Father, it's it's my understanding that in America today there are very few, if any, uh, traditional Catholic colleges or, or universities. So... What is a traditional Catholic young person to do today? You know, we, we have all of these uh, non-Catholic, at best, anti-Catholic, at worst, uh, options for higher education. And, and these these colleges and these universities, they are well-known and well-documented uh, breeding grounds for, for liberalism and anti-religion sentiment. So is it worth the uh, the risk for a traditional Catholic young person to go to to attend the, these colleges and universities today? And what do you recommend uh, for your students here at Immaculate Concession Academy? Do you think it is worth it? Well, Tom, I know that uh, people have been writing in about this, asking about, you know, what should I do? I mean, some of them have a very practical question. What should I do? I have a, a child who is graduating from high school and facing college. Uh, others are just kind of curious, you know, about in principle, should they be going to institutions of higher learning here in the United States of America? Uh, but you just asked about five questions. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm not sure where to start on this. Uh, <laughs> perhaps, questions. perhaps you know, you're, you're just relaying what you're getting yes. uh, on the emails, mm-hmm. and people have been asking about these things. Yeah. Uh, but the fact is, uh, you know, the... the Institutions of higher learning, so-called, uh, here in the United States of America, have been largely taken over by um, by leftists, communists, liberal socialists, progressives, whatever you want to call them. Sure. Uh, they are all anti-God, anti-faith, anti-especially Catholic Church, of course. And um, this is, uh, you know, if you, if you want to put your children at risk of losing their faith, losing morality, losing whatever dignity they have, send them to college today. It comes down to that, unfortunately, too often. A young person has to have a very strong, strong faith, a strong moral character, in order to face the withering blast of, um, of, of immorality and, and, and blasphemy and all the rest that they're going to hear in college. And, of course, they're, they're at the mercy of these merciless leftists who are doing the work of the devil and in perverting the minds of the children. So I, uh, you know, when you, when you say, what do I recommend to my students here? I, I, I tell them that if, well, I'll tell you exactly what I told the last group last year, that if they could make a living and, uh, you know, pre- raise a family and, you know, uh, cover the expenses of a family without having gone to college, I'd really prefer they do that. I, I wish I had a class full of entrepreneurs who could just uh, start businesses and make them go, and make them grow, and, and uh, simply avoid the whole, the whole college scene, which is not only a, a huge, at the very least, it's a waste of time and a waste of money learning a lot of useless things, at the, at the very least, I say. But we know that it's much worse than that. It's more than just a huge waste of time and a huge waste of money. Um, it is a, a matter of becoming an indentured servant of the government with the government loans often that people have to, to take out to earn their degrees, which often wind up to be worthless or worth much less than the investment, certainly. In the process of having to sit through so many 
uh, so many classes run by uh, Marxists, uh, who, whose primary goal is to destroy all vestiges of faith. Uh, the virtue of faith in every soul. This is their primary goal, it seems, just from the way they conduct their classes and what they teach, and how they react to those who object to the, the blasphemous things they say. So, um, I, I would myself recommend avoiding them like the plague. Impossible. Now, one can go and learn a trade and actually do very well in the trades today because, I mean, let's face it, there are, there are not all that many young people who are willing to work. And we have the, the craftsmen of old who are really excellent at their, at their tasks. And, um, but they are not going to be with us always. And they're going to be retiring. And we need some young, strong, smart, well-established well, uh, uh, experts in the fields of uh, plumbing and electrical and the rest, you know, to come in and take their place. And those we know who have gone into these fields are doing very well for themselves because they're very much in demand. And they're very much in demand because they know how to work. They're not afraid to work. And employers love them. They look upon them as pure gold because I have, a, I have somebody who will work in the trades for me. I can trust who will get the job done and do it right. It takes a certain uh, a, you know, a sense of not pride in the sense of bad sense, but a certain responsibility for his work, to perform the work and to do it well. So again, going into the trades um, is, is in many ways preferable for someone who has the skills, the, the talent, uh, has, let's say, the latent skills that can be, you know, trained and, 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 uh, and uh, let's say, perfected for that task. <clears throat> um, that's, that's certainly a, a, an opportunity for people uh, to learn something that would be useful and also, um, I guess you'd say today, marketable without uh, getting into all of the uh, radical Marxism. Mm. Um, but the, the fact is, the way things are set up in our society today, there are those who have to go to college. They have to go through a college program. And they can't just go to a college program that teaches them how to handle a certain function. They have to learn, they have to go to all of these English classes, literature classes, mm -hmm. media classes, and all the rest that are often just, just so perverted. They have to sit through them and they have to regurgitate the nonsense or in some cases even the blasphemies. And I, I, I hope they don't regurgitate those if they refuse to go along with those uh, just to get through, just to get a, a piece of paper and a degree that there are many employers who don't even take seriously. I mean, people invest tens of thousands of dollars in, in student loans to get degrees and find that they are having a very hard time finding a job. Um, because um, now that these student lo loans are available to so many, there are so many people pursuing these degrees, and people who uh, ultimately may not be qualified at all. But the market uh, can be really glutted, or the, the, job, the job market can be, can be glutted by those seeking jobs. And so... Um, Nonetheless, the fact remains, though, that to accomplish certain things in our society, one has to have that college degree. And uh, one has to jump through all the hoops and all the rest in order to get that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there are those who are needed in those capacities. So, for example, the teachers. The teachers at the school are required to have at least a bachelor's degree. That's the state requirement. And uh, at the state, uh, a bachelor's degree from a recognized institution of higher learning here in anywhere in the United States, as long as the um, uh, Board of Education in the state of Ohio recognize them, you know, then they can, <clears throat> they can teach in our school. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we need to hire people who are of very strong faith, excellent moral, char moral character, who have been through programs where they actually have succeeded in getting degrees. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. We have wonderful teachers there right now, and they're really top-notch mm -hmm. in every way, I mean, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, intellectually, in terms of the education they can give, spiritually, morally, I think they're very highest caliber people. So it is possible to do this. Mm -hmm. But for everyone who succeeds, I'm afraid there might be thousands who don't. 
Well, Father, you say that there are some who should go and some that even have to go to college, but how, how does one know, how does a, a say, an 18-year-old high school graduate, how do they know if they are one of those who is meant to go to college or pursue well, a trade? Well, in the know? first place, I mean, I think they should consult their parents. <clears throat> okay. Their parents love them best of all, of anybody in the world, we hope. <laughs> and... Uh, so what advice they give might not be infallible, but at least they know it's motivated by a genuine love for them. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, parents might think in terms of the dollar, chasing the dollar, and what would give them the best income, and that's the priority. But that's not the priority. The priority is education. And ultimately, education is the formation of the intellect, which is a faculty of the soul. So we're talking about the formation of the soul here and the formation of the conscience. And so that should be their priority, right. the formation of the soul of their child. If more parents thought in terms of their children's soul and the risk of their soul, the saving of their soul, if they thought in those terms, uh, their advice would be somewhat different. Yet even if they gave the same advice, they'd be more careful. Um, but in any case, I, I think this, the individual student has to also exercise a certain amount of discretion. I mean, let's face it, by, by the time... Uh, young man or a young woman, and they should be, by the time they graduate high school, be young men and young women, because they have to start making decisions for themselves now. You'd think that they would be able to assess their own moral condition and be aware of their weaknesses, and hopefully their high school years would have shown them where their weaknesses are, and enable them to realize, well, I'm in a certain danger here, and this probably would not be the best place for me, considering kind of the campus life I see or the things I hear about, you know, this particular college or not. So, I mean, you'd want the students themselves uh, graduating from high school and facing now a college career, as they like to call it. <laughs> you'd like them to be very prudent in their choice. And them also, you'd like them also to be thinking in terms of, well, how can I you know, receive the, the education I need to go into my chosen profession? at least as far as I can know it now, and yet safeguard my soul. Uh, if the young person goes into college with the idea it's party time, I'm out from under the roof of my mom and dad, and I'm free, and I can do what I want, and have fun with my friends, and that's what college is all about, then I'd be, I mean, I'd tremble for the future of that mm -hmm. child, um, <clears throat> ever growing up. Uh, but in any case, again, parents have to be aware of that too. But it, going to college requires a certain amount of maturity already in these young people. And uh, they need to be realistic about that mm -hmm. when they examine their own consciences. Their parents need to be realistic about it. I think they should also talk about the priests who know, who know their son or their daughter and others who might be able to give them, give them very good advice. Other Catholic men, gentlemen and ladies, some who've been through the college experience, although they're usually the generation ahead, I think they should also talk to um, graduates who've gone before them and might be two or three years ahead of them in college and talk to good, solid Catholic young men and women who are now perhaps graduating from college and taking their young people to talk to them and finding out where the pitfalls are. So there, are, and, and uh, thirdly, I would ask them to uh, take them to uh, people in academia. I mean, we know Catholic college professors, and, and even those who are not traditional Catholic, people who still have the faith, they might be confused about things today, but they still have the principle of the faith, and they, they're fighting a battle within those colleges to maintain some semblance of, of uh, knowledge of the natural law, love for God, you know, standing up for what is right, to actually have them talk to those who are in academia to get advice. All of that should be sought. Father, there's a particular scenario that, that I've seen play out many times. It seems to be very commonplace, and I'd like to get your, your take on this. And the scenario is that a, uh, say, 17, 18, 19-year-old uh, student will graduate from high school and is unsure of the career path that they would like to follow. And the advice that they are given very, very often is, that's okay if you don't know what you want to do yet. Go ahead and go to college and get all of your, your general education classes out of the way. You can kind of figure it out as you go. 
Would you recommend that course of action, Father? Someone who who is totally unsure uh, of what career path they would like they would like to follow. They don't know yet if they uh, would like to go into something that actually requires a college degree. They don't know yet if they would want to go into some kind of trade. Uh, but they just go ahead to college and just get their general education credits out of the way, and hopefully, hopefully along the way, somehow, kind of. I would suggest there. they not go to college. I think that'd be a waste of their life until they're for certain. A waste of money. I'd say go ahead and get a job. Yeah. Work, work in various trades. Yeah. Um, find out what you want to do, and um, give it some thought. But don't just launch out into that very dark, tempestuous sea uh, in your little boat there, hoping to find land somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, that, 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 I think, would be suicidal. Would you, would you say that the majority of high school graduates uh, at least have some, somewhat of a, a good idea of what kind of field they would like to go into? I think many of them do. Uh, not all. Uh, perhaps... Perhaps half or more than half, in my experience, have a good idea what they want to go into. Mm -hmm. And about half of those who know are very definite about it. Others are thinking about a general category of work they'd like to do. Others, not so much. You know, it depends on who they knew, who they were close to, what they, what they got involved in while they were, let's say, in high school. And what they found they had an aptitude for, and what they found that they... Uh, uh, they, they, they had a personal interest in. Some you know, are very interested in um, computers. They really get into it. And they find they have a, a knack for it, too. You know? Others would die a thousand deaths before doing something like that. Others actually think in terms of going into accounting. Whereas others would find that to be uh, like going to purgatory, uh, doing accounting work. So it, it depends on you know what uh, we need them all. Uh, we need our welders, right, and our uh, and our pilots, and certainly we need our priests and religious too. We can't forget that in terms of a career. There we're talking about a vocation. You know? But I think that when we're talking to these young people about following their career path, as you say, uh, we have to be talking to them about their vocation, because they can become lawyers and doctors, Indian chiefs, and so on. And these are avocations, but they're not vocations. Right. They're just a means to serve another end, and the end is their vocation. The vocation is their service to God in this life, what God wants them to do with their life that he's given them. And if, they, um, if they're going to be single in the world, um, and there are those young people who think that that probably is what they're called to, for whatever reason, uh, God is giving them the grace to see that. So they might be thinking about that. Um... But still, I mean, you want them to go into a profession that will give them a very strong purpose in life as something that would be a service to God. You know, others uh, pursuing the married life to bring life into the world and nurture the children, uh, the future generation, that's a real vocation from God. People are called to do that. <clears throat> and so, again, when they're, when they're facing the prospect of earning a living and supporting a family, they should be thinking about, okay, how best to do that in the world today and safeguard my own soul um, in the process? Because if I don't safeguard my own soul, how am I going to safeguard the souls of my, my spouse and my child? Um, so, uh, you know, all of these, these things are, are, play a very important role in deciding uh, what profession or what work am I going to do for the sake of earning the money that my family needs. <laughs> to provide the food and the clothing and the shelter and the insurance and all the rest that I have to provide for my family. Um, so you, you really can't separate this. I, you know, I don't think you should separate anyway in the child's mind, and it certainly shouldn't be separated in my mind, our minds when we're talking to the children, um, about what they want to do for a living as to why they want to make a living and who they're going to be making a living for. Is it going to be for them personally? Is it going to be for the... <laughs> to support the church? Is it going to be a missionary effort? Is it going to be for the sake of providing for a family? Mm -hmm. Those are important questions to answer in connection with this. And Father, that, that ties in with something you said earlier, and I'd like to return to this point. We're talking about the, the parents giving advice, uh, career advice, uh, college advice to their 
to their high school graduates. And you, you said that parents sometimes will will think in terms of dollars uh, alone. And in a sense, uh, you know, that is definitely something that has has to be considered. You know, as you said, there are so many college degrees today that, that can be totally totally useless. And I think in, in a sense, though, that, that is a very good thing to consider because, you know, if, if one does have a, a married vacation, say they, they do need to have some kind of career that is able to uh, support a family. And that's, uh, as you know, becoming harder and harder. Well, to do today. you know, some people give advice to young people, do what you love, do what you love. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, some people, some young people go up and they say, well, yeah, I want to start out doing what I love. It Follow your passion. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. You know, you find, you find yourself working toward that. Mm. Uh, but you, most young people are just out there trying to make some money and learn a few things, and yeah. and uh, you know find their way find their way through. Uh, so to tell them do what you love doesn't help them from the beginning, right? Because they might not find anything they love and do nothing, you know. And they take that advice quite literally. That's not the answer. I mean, there, are, there there's a great lesson for young people in in doing what is needed. If it's a matter of supporting a family. I mean, how many men, and now women, too, are working a job or two or three to support their family because of economic conditions that, as Father Becca said, the mayor and old missionary said, were being created in America to take the parents away from the family and to leave the children uh, as wards of the state in the public schools. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to factor in the fact that, that, that the children need to learn to work, whether they enjoy it or not. Mm -hmm. That's a very important part of their lives, to, uh, to learn to get the job done regardless. And you don't want them saying, okay, I enjoy this, and therefore I'm going to make a, um, a living out of it. It may be their hobby, but you can't really make a, a living out of just doing your own hobby. I mean, somebody may say, well, I want to go into, um, you know, making uh, some, like, special... I want to go into art. I want to go into art deco, or I want to go to, uh, like, what do they call it? Performance art. Because that's what I enjoy, you know? So I'm going to go into that. And you say, well, how are you going to support it? You can't support a family on that. You can't even support yourself on that. This is just a hobby of yours. Unfortunately, there are many doing it. And the ones who are the most perverse in doing it are the ones who are getting paid for it. And they're getting paid by for perverted people. But, I mean, other than that, I mean, the, the art, the performance art thing is not a field that, you know, pe people could expect to make a living in. It's just a hobby. And so, again, you know, you have to get the, the young people past the idea of, of I just want to do what I enjoy. Yeah. And uh, to let them understand, no, I have to do what is necessary to fulfill the higher purpose, and that is my vocation. And, you know, Father, it seems that conventional wisdom tells us something like this, that if you get a college degree, that, that gives you a kind of competitive edge in the, the job market. It, it gives you gives you an advantage, perhaps, over some of your peers. It opens up more doors, more opportunities, more career opportunities for you for, for better careers and, and better better paying jobs, better opportunities. Would you say that that is, that is still true, though, today? I would say it probably does open the first door. But from that moment on, once you've opened that first door and you've gone through it and you got a job, you have to perform. Mm -hmm. And unless your 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 uncle is the CEO, you're going to have to perform perform the job or get out. Mm -hmm. And if they find somebody who doesn't have a degree, I mean, they might even have a corporate policy. We don't hire anybody unless they have a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. Yeah. They might even have that. So you don't even get an opportunity. Yeah. In which case, I'd say, well, go ahead and start your own company. And show them what success really is. You know, sure. there are plenty who've done that. Plenty who've done that. Although it's very hard today, but you have to be a very hard worker and hard work. They say it's like what one percent inspiration and ten ninety nine percent perspiration. Right. Right? <laughs> and you talk to entrepreneurs who've been successful, and they will they all say the same thing. It's very hard work, a lot of privations, and it's very humbling. But if you if you persevere, you can really succeed beyond your wildest dreams. But they, all, all of the people who have been through that had the same advice. Be charitable as you go. Right? Don't be selfish about it. Think of it, what you're doing, as having a higher purpose. Okay? Uh, not just being Scrooge McDuck to swim through your money. <clears throat> and because to work that hard at something, you have to see a higher purpose in it 
than just chasing a buck. Yeah. <laughs> but in any case, I, I would say that, uh, you know, there, there are those who find that, uh, you know, what they want to go into, whatever it might be, some technical field. Yes, they do have to have certain certificates. They have to meet and met certain requirements, even have a college degree or, or two or three in order to qualify even to get in, even to get on the, uh, on the radar there, as it were. And, uh, the, but they have to be prepared for that, uh, to do that. So, um, but it'd give a competitive edge. Yeah, it might determine whether or not they even get a chance to, pers to enter the field. But uh, once, they, once they get in there, though, they, they have to be able to perform and willing to perform mm -hmm. and get the job done or no amount of paper is going to save them. Right. Well, Father, I'd like to return to another point that we've kind of touched on, and that's this idea of the, the student loan debt. You know, I, I think right now in America, the number is somewhere around $2 trillion of, of student loan debt. And uh, what is the morality of this, Father? Do you, do you think it's a sin against prudence to, to borrow this kind, of mon this kind of money for a college education? What, what kind of parameters would you set for someone, say perhaps someone who, who has, you know, gone through all of this... Uh, these lines of reasoning that, that you've laid out and they have determined that, yes, in fact, they should go to college, they want to go to college, they think it's necessary. What kind of parameters would you lay out? As well, as I, I know points? enough young people who, who've gone so far into debt with their student loans that once they get the degree, they get in the, the, you know, successfully in the job market and get jobs, they're loaded, laden with this debt. Then they're trying to uh, get married. They're trying to start a family with this debt hanging over their heads. And... Um, it's, it's a debt slavery, is what it is. I mean, it, it really is a form of socialism. To get people into debt in this way, our young people, to get them into debt in such a way that they have to work for 10, 15, 20 years to amortize the student loans that they've got. Right? I mean, I, I personally think that is gravely, gravely, not only wrong politically, economically, but even morally. Uh, it's a socialist program. It is a socialist program. So, Since when was the United States government supposed to be in, a, in, in that business mm -hmm. to uh, make student loans, to get people through these universities? Mm -hmm. And I think it, the, the point is to get as many of these kids into these classrooms with these Marxist professors, to get as many of them as doctorate, doctorate as possible, and then to have them have, have like a, a chain around their neck, a chain of debt. So I think, you know, somebody wants to be a hairdresser and takes out $30,000 in student loans to get to be a hairdresser, how long is it going to take them to pay that off? And what kind of debt slavery are they going to be in? What are they going to bring to a marriage then? But debt. So should students be borrowing any money at all to go to college? I mean, I can't say that universally with regard to everybody, right? But to borrow it from the government, you know, yeah. I mean, I just can't see how that's an American thing to do, honestly. What should, um, what should one But I mean, what should uh, do but, uh, You know, it depend, depends on whether they really are entering a field which will enable them, which has a very high likelihood of providing them to making an income. They can pay that debt off quickly and get rid of it, you know. But they certainly don't want to get married with a load of debt over them. And if they have a load of debt, they, couldn't, they wouldn't even be accepted in the seminary. They'd have to pay off that debt. All of it? They'd have to get that debt paid off substantially. They'd have to have the reason that somebody would be paying that debt off. <laughs> um, but I, I can pretty well guarantee you that the, the seminary, our seminary, would not accept anyone who had a, you know, an outstanding twenty, thirty thousand dollar debt they had to pay off, and how, and they have no other means of doing it by, by working. How is it possible? Right. Um, maybe they have to find somebody else to pay the debt off for them, just to allow them to be free enough to go to the, go to the seminary. But you see, it really is. Uh, it really is forging a chain, uh, an, an economic chain. There are great Catholic, Catholic writers who've written about how um, the socialist plan to socialize nations is to get them deeply into debt. Get the nation, get the, the citizens of a nation deeply, deeply into debt. Because who's going to pay the debt of the nation? The citizens. They have to be taxed for that. They have to be, uh, I mean, they, they become the indentured servant of the creditor. If it's the Federal Reserve Banking System to which the money is owed, 
or whatever. I mean, it's you know, it's uh, it goes back to the time of kings and the kings um, t- taking uh, loans from uh, banking houses, right, to, to pursue wars. Who pays for all that? The peasants in the field, and uh, it's a form of tyranny. We see it happening before our eyes, but our young people are, are already are already graduating. If they graduate from college, if they graduate, they're already graduating with some in some cases massive debt, which will keep them in bondage for years. Mm-hmm. And I would just recommend them don't do that. That's very imprudent. You mentioned the sin of imprudence. I'd say that's the least you can say. Mm-hmm. Um, now, look, I mean, there are Democratic candidates for the, the nomination for you know. Democratic nomination for president that they are saying, well, we'll just forgive all the debts. You know, we'll just write it all off. But that's how socialists do things. Um, But somebody's going to pay for that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren or someone like that might say, yes, we'll just write it all off. Well, they can afford to do it because they're not going to pay that. But somebody is going to pay for that. Um... Through taxation, or some other means. Yeah. Well, Father, another question I'd like to ask in regards to this uh, this topic of traditional Catholics and, and their uh, our, our viewpoint on college education, higher education. How do you feel about young women entering uh, institutions of, of higher learning? You know, there's. Uh, it, it seems on the surface that uh, a young woman who is going into college, she she is typically of age to be married, and it seems that 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 a a college career could be a serious deterrent to to marriage if one is uh, say in in the middle of pursuing a college degree, or uh, even if one already has a, a college degree, like you said, if they have some kind of debt that they're kind that they're trying to pay off, that could be a deterrent to marriage. But even if they're in the process of obtaining this uh, this college degree. It seems that that is a serious deterrent to marriage. So how, how, do you, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about young women entering college? Well, society being the way it is today, you know, unfortunately, that there are women who actually have to work to support themselves, and including having to have to work to support families. It's the way it's set up. And again, you know, in socialist nations, they kind of lean that way, almost. Why? Because they undermine the masculinity of the man. Um, they under they undermine that. You know, if the man is supposed to be, by God, the provider. And in leftist, progressive, Marxist nations, um, they they want they want to equalize everything, right? Including gender equality, right? They push and push and push for that. Hey, Tom, you look at the old pictures from Soviet Russia and from communist China. <clears throat> Soviet Russia after Lenin, Stalin. Soviet Russia, I mean, I'm sorry, Communist China after Mao. And you notice that the men and the women are, are put in costumes. They're, they're wearing like these official Soviet uniforms, right? And they're dressing the same. They're supposed to act the same. They do the same work in the factories and so on. The idea is to destroy the whole idea of the family. And the real relationship between man and woman that forms the basis for a family and for the education of the children, the formation of the children. This is what they were after. They wanted the sole allegiance to be to the party, always the Communist Party. Big brother, right? All of our love, all of our devotion is directed to the party, the will of the party. And in order to make that happen, they have to destroy the allegiances in the family, they have to get the children to denounce the parents for speaking against the party. They have to get the spouses turning each other in for expressing sentiments against the party. Right? And this is tyranny that not only is past, but it's coming. This is the kind of tyranny the leftists want, are, are trying right now to put in place. And um, <clears throat> when you... When you see this with women, the idea of getting them into the colleges, even though they're just going to college for the sake of going to college, maybe they're there looking for an MRS degree, as they say, right? They just want to find somebody to marry. That idea to look around colleges, for try to find somebody to marry, you might, you might find somebody there, but um, um, there are a lot of other pla- better places to look, <laughs> perhaps. 
Uh, but in any case, and I don't mean the bars, they're certainly <laughs> not there, ever. Okay. But in any case, the, um, you know, I would say if, if, if there's a woman who is thinking, perhaps my vocation is not to the religious life. Perhaps my vocation is not to the married life. I don't know. And I do have to make provisions for providing for myself. And so I'm going to pursue a higher education for that purpose. I would say, well, she has a legitimate reason to do that. She has to take safeguards, you know, for her virtue, her purity, her <clears throat> integrity, you know. Um, but uh, she might also say, well, I want to go into teaching. And this is what I want to do professionally. And perhaps even as a, as a sister, you know, as a religious. And she might find out that um, a degree would be helpful in this regard. I would say to her, well, if you have a vocation of religious life, it's a big risk for you to go to college. So you'd better talk, if you think you have a vocation of religious life, you'd better talk to the superiors of the religious community and ask what they would advise you to do, what they would want you to do, assuming that you would be trying to enter and, you know, pursue the religious life there, and follow their advice and their wishes in that matter. Because the religious life is your vocation, anything else you're doing in college is an avocation, right? And must be at the service of the vocation. But um, all in all, I mean, uh, just... If a, if, a, if a young lady who's graduating from high school is quite certain that uh, her vocation, if she, as far as she can see, because no one's infallible about this, but as far as she can see, the married life, then if she feels that she has to get a degree as backup insurance because she fears if she marries, the man she marries may not be reliable um, or capable of supporting the family. <clears throat> I would say to her that that's a very scary proposition that you think you need to have that degree uh, to your credit uh, for fear that perhaps the man you marry will not be willing or able to take care of your family financially. But the other thing is this sent uh, that would mean if she's not going to go and pursue a degree and she's going to try to uh, give herself wholeheartedly to the married state, then she's got to be very, very careful about the man she marries. She's got to marry a man she can really count on, a man who has not only the, the, the necessary intelligence, skills, but also the drive, the, the, the industry and the enthusiasm and the moral character to provide for that family. But Father, what if a young woman uh, wants to obtain a college degree as just a type of insurance if something were to happen to her husband, if he were to become incapacitated and couldn't work, or even if he were to pass away and leave her with, with a family full of children to take care of? What do you think of that idea? Well, it's certainly a possibility, and we've seen that happen, yes. right? It does happen at times. But the fact is, I mean, you have to, she has to kind of weigh um, the benefits of having that degree and that insurance against what her vacation is, let's say, right now. I mean, if she's going to uh, put all of that at risk, if she's already going to be putting at risk her vocation by going to college and uh, saying, well, I'm not ready to marry because I'm still working on my degree. I mean, she might actually have God provide her a very good husband or a very good prospect of a husband, but she might be thinking, well, I'm concentrating on my degree now because things might not turn out right. Well. The fact is that she's so stark, uh, you know, so focused on that degree, so obsessing about the degree, <coughs> she might be making the disaster happen right now <coughs> and missing the opportunity of, of what God really wants her to do. So <coughs> these people uh, we're talking about here in the abstract are very real people. Yeah. It, it happened to real people. Yes. And they need to be talking to others who have the wisdom and the love for them and the love for God to advise them. <coughs> So it's very hard to talk about these things in the abstract, <clears throat> as though one size fits all. But I would just say that somebody 
a young woman who finds herself, but also a young man, too, who finds himself, themselves in these situations, really need to have people in their lives they can go to for uh, not only human wisdom, but for divine wisdom, you know, because of the prayers and, and the charity backed up by hope, backed up by faith, or supported by faith. If, if, one of, if our young people <clears throat> don't have anyone to go to, if there's a young person today who's facing questions like that, and he has, or she has no one to go to that they trust to give them good advice, that person is really adrift. They're in, they're in trouble. So I would like to think that our young people, our traditional Catholic young people, the product of our own Catholic education, whether in our traditional Catholic schools or our traditional Catholic homes, would certainly have someone to go to. Mm -hmm. A loving mother, a loving father, <clears throat> pastor, religious, other people in the in the church that they respect, uh, older brothers and sisters who've been through it and had these decisions and either learned the easy way or the hard way, but they learned you know, the answers to serious questions. But they could go to them and get good advice. And I'd like to, um, again, I'd hope these young men and young women would show their young men and, not, and young women, not just boys and girls, but their young men and young women because they have the humility to listen and to learn and to recognize good advice and follow it. Mm -hmm. That's the hard part because all too often they're very headstrong because they don't know. <clears throat> and because they don't know and they're headstrong, they don't listen to those who do know. They're trying to advise them correctly. So... Uh, prayer, 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 prayer is essential. Receiving the sacraments, absolutely essential. Father, another question that, that comes to mind on this topic of, of colleges, perhaps this can be a very short answer to kind of to kind of wrap this up, uh, but one one final thing, what what do you think about the idea of college dormitories and, and traditional Catholics living in a, a college dormitory? Because it, it, it seems to me, Father, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it seems to me that this is an absolute recipe for disaster where, um, oh, yeah. you know, you, you have these, uh, all, all these non-Catholic, very anti-Catholic uh, young people living together in, in very close quarters and on these college campuses. Do you think that that's any place for a traditional Catholic? Well, I mean, it can work out. You know, one could get a good moral roommate or a no roommate, and it could work out. But the danger is so great. I think when it does work out, it's almost surprising because it seems to be a rarity. But you hear horror stories of those who live in the dorms. Say, absolutely not. Don't send your children away to live in a dormitory. Some of these dormitories are just dens of iniquity. You know, with the drink and the marijuana and all the rest going on there and the, 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 the dress and the invasions. Some of them have co-ed dorms. I mean, this is how debauched they are. So um, keep your children at home. They're still yours. They're still your children, too, and you still have to take care of them. You're still responsible for them. Uh, you can't just launch, launch them into, uh, you know, uh, you, you launch them into college, in some ways it might be just launching them into hell. <clears throat> so, no, you, you've, got to, you've got to keep them close, close at hand. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, the college scene is uh, just... Uh, very, very, very dangerous situation these days. And again, I would say uh, that we, we need certain of our young people to be able to succeed in college, get through, get their degrees, actually learn something uh, necessary to you know, perform the services that are needed for all this. We need traditional Catholic doctors, uh, physicians, right? Yes. We need today traditional Catholic attorneys to fight the good fight, you know, the pro-life fight, and to protect the innocent and see the fight for justice, you know, and uh, protect our rights, especially our right to practice our faith. We need those attorneys. <clears throat> They're not going to get a degree out of a box of Cranker Jacks, you know. Uh, they're going to have to work for it. But... Uh, in the process of doing so, they're going to have to be very strong uh, in their faith, in their hope, and their love for God. And any, any youngster who, who doesn't go into uh, higher academia <laughs> with that, fully well, well armed for that, is going to 
I'm afraid suffer fate worse than death. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I can't say and I won't say that under no circumstances should a young man or a young woman today uh, uh, go on to college. I just, they better be very careful, very, very, very careful what college they, go, they choose and what uh, degree they're aiming for. But they, they have to be very certain what they want to accomplish there and stay out of harm's way. Keep their rosaries handy, right? Keep their souls in the state of grace, receive the sacraments, be faithful to our Lord. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy with uh, so many of our graduates, Tom, uh, because time and time again, we see them year after year, getting into the colleges when they go and getting involved in the pro-life effort, <clears throat> either as leaders, followers, if there is no pro-life effort at the college, they'll start one. And they'll start it from nothing and start gathering pro-life uh, pro students around them. If there is a pro-life effort that's faltering, they will get behind it and they'll push. If they find one that's already there, they'll lend their hands to help in every way they can. This is, this is a very, very good thing because it gets them involved with others like them who are there to fight the good fight for our Lord. They believe in the natural law. They have a certain love for God. Uh, you know, again, I would say don't let them just go off to college thinking, well, I have to get a, a degree that says I served my time <laughs> and in the classroom here <clears throat> and pushed the right buttons and gave all the right answers to this communist teacher I've got. But um, let them try to accomplish some good there. Let them go with that idea that they're going as crusaders <clears throat> into a hostile land and they're going to... They're going to go there as warriors for our Lord, Father, for their faith, for their church. We have a few minutes left. Is there uh, anything else you'd like to bring up on the program tonight? Any kind of current events or anything? Anything to do with Francis? Anything going oh, on? Oh, well, there's the magic thing. <laughs> Couldn't let a whole program go by without saying I that. guess not. I guess not. Well, you know, Tom, uh, I guess since you ask, <laughs> um, you, know, you know, Francis says he wants to turn the, the church into a synodal church, you know. Yes. <clears throat> well, what does this mean? Well, you read his... his explanations of what he means by that and you know you can't help but see the parallels between what the Bolsheviks turned Russia into when they Sovietized it I mean Soviet why is it called the Soviet Union why is it called Soviet Russia under Lenin and Stalin well Soviet is the Russian for a like a council <clears throat> It's like, a, it's like a workers' council. And you get this council of handpicked people together to determine the fate. And you get these councils over councils. And up to the big, the party, the party itself oversees all these councils. You know. It's a Soviet system, you know. <clears throat> but it all works supposedly from the ground up. But you know it really doesn't, does it? It didn't in the Bolsheviks' uh, land. And it, it doesn't when they when they... When the totalitarians and the dictators and all start talking about forming these little work groups and so on, they've already got a predetermined conclusion. They pick the ones they're going to listen to. They pick those who are going to serve in those councils and who are going to be the voices there. They have a predetermined uh, ending that they're, they're working toward. And so it is with Francis, too. That's exactly what he's been doing. He wants to Sovietize the church. He wants to turn it into the Soviet Church of... Uh, uh, well, a Pachamama or whoever, you know, the, uh, hey, look, <clears throat> you, you, you saw the staff, you heard about the staff he carried there, you know, you know that to start the, the, um, the, the liturgy they used to start the youth synod, right, was actually a witch's stang. Everybody knows that now. Right. And um, everyone has seen the picture of him carrying this, carrying this thing. Okay, uh, many have seen the picture of the two witches who gave him this, the capitalists, right. who gave him the stain. <clears throat> and now here he is in the closing mass of the Amazon Synod, <clears throat> carrying the staff with the four faces of the four gods and goddesses, right? The four prime gods and goddesses pictured there in relief on his staff of uh, the Mother Earth Goddess, the Father God, God, 
the moon god, the sun god, the faces are there all around us, all around the staff, right? very prominently featured there. And he carries that into their liturgy there. Um, you know where this is going. I mean, he wants to, uh, he wants to de-Christianize the world. He certainly wants to de-Christianize the souls of Catholics. And um, his aim is that of Voltaire. <clears throat> There's no doubt about it. And he intends to accomplish that by these Soviets that he's calling to the Vatican and presiding over um, to accomplish this very evil purpose. It just is amazing to me there are those who still insist on going ahead with this. And it, it amazes me also that there are those who insist that they can still say at the altar, even in, in, the, in the 1962 Latin Mass that they offer, like the Society of St. Pius X, the Fraternity of St. Peter, or the Institute of Christ the King, that they can still say, Una cum Papa Nostro, Francesco. They can still, they can say that they are one in faith with him. And I know there are those who insist, no, that's not what it means. That's exactly what it means. Read the prayer, the first prayer of the canon of the traditional Mass. And it says exactly this whole point. Wherefore, we humbly pray and beseech thee, most merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, to receive and to bless these gifts, these presents, these holy, unspotted sacrifices, which we offer up to thee in the first place for thy holy Catholic Church, that it may please thee to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and guide her throughout the world, as also for thy servant, Francis, our and so-and-so our bishop, and for all who are orthodox in belief and who profess the Catholic and apostolic faith. And that's the conclusion of the prayer. There are those who want us to say, well, it's just a matter of praying for Francis. It's a matter of praying for the bishop of Francis in the diocese. Sir. Look, it says it all, when it says, we are praying for these and these and these and all, and it's supposed to include, it's not saying, well, we're praying for Francis, <laughs> we're praying for the bishop, and we're also praying for those who have the faith and those who profess the faith. As though it's saying, well, this excludes the Francis, Francis and uh, the bishop from having to have the faith, but because it says we're praying for Francis and praying for those, and then it says we're praying for those who have the Catholic faith. Now, those who try to make us understand the prayer that way, are false prophets. The, that's ridiculous. That's absurd. Right. The fact is, it assumes, it presumes, it takes for granted, you might say, that the Pope and the Bishop are of those who are orthodox in their belief and who profess the Catholic and apostolic faith. It is a lie. It is a, it is a bald-faced lie when... <clears throat> You speak of Francis and his Novus Ordo Bishop as professing the Catholic and Apostolic faith because they don't do so. And so many of these clergymen agree with that point. They understand that. If you were to ask them, <clears throat> are you one in faith with Francis? <clears throat> so many of them would actually say, well, no, I'm not. I am not one in faith with Francis. Would you consider it to be a faucet telling a lie to say that you are one in faith with Francis? I think many of these men would say, yes, I, 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 it would not be true to say that I am one in faith with Francis. And yet they will stand there at the most solemn moment of their life when they're about to consecrate the body and blood of Christ in the Latin Mass, the traditional Mass, and say those words and realizing that this is not true. I'm professing something that is not true. I'm telling God, and I'm telling the congregation here, that Francis is professing the true and apostolic faith, the Catholic faith, when I know that's not true. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a great evil. Um, as I mentioned one time before, Tom, and I, I, you, know, you gave me the hint there that we've got to wrap things up, and I understand that. 
But there was a time when Monsignor Lefebvre, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, came to the seminary in Ridgefield. And he called me into the room, and I saw him. And he asked me, point blank, <clears throat> do you say the name of, at that time, John Paul II in the canon of the Mass? And I told him, no, Monsieur, I do not. I never have to this day. And he was silent for a moment, and then he said, well, why not? <clears throat> and I said to him, I, he might have been expecting me to say, well, he's not the Pope, we all know he's not the Pope. But what I said to him was, Monsignor Lefebvre, <clears throat> I understand that what I'm saying there is that I am one in faith with him. <clears throat> and I don't believe that's true. <clears throat> I have good reason to believe that I am not one in faith with John Paul II. Because I hold the traditional Catholic faith in its entirety. And based upon statements that he's made and actions that he performed, I have good reason to believe that he does not hold to the traditional Catholic faith. <clears throat> and as I'm standing at the altar about to consecrate the body and blood of Christ and facing our Lord there in the host, I cannot... Be, be telling a bald-faced lie and stating something in prayer there that, I do, that I'm convinced is not true. <clears throat> said, I think that'd be a sacrilege. And Monsieur Lefebvre <clears throat> just sat there, it seemed for, well, it seemed like a long time. And then he, he, complete, he dropped the subject, never brought it up again. Never brought it up to me again. <laughs> And Tom, all, all, I could, all I could think is because he, he probably agrees. I'm quite sure that Monsieur Lefebvre himself agrees that, that he himself could not say that I am certain of the fact that I am one in faith with Paul VI, John Paul II, uh, certainly Francis. No, today. If it's ever become apparent, it is apparent today that one cannot honestly say <clears throat> that he is one in faith with Francis, if he's really, if he is a Catholic, if he's a Catholic priest, he cannot say that he's one in faith with Francis, honestly. So, um, again, you know, this all comes down to very serious matters, and you said, well, there are other things uh, in the offing here that uh, I think would be worthy of mention, and so there you are. <laughs> Father, uh, do, you, do you pray for Francis? Do you think that we should pray for Francis? I pray that he will save his soul, yeah. I pray, you know, I, I pray that if by some stretch of the imagination he really has the Catholic faith somewhere, I mean, it's not what he's professing, but if, that God will give him the grace to, to profess that faith, the true Catholic faith. You know? I pray that if he does not have the Catholic faith, as from all appearances he does not, yet he absolutely explicitly rejects the Catholic faith, I pray that God will give him that faith and then give him the fortitude and the love for God to profess it even unto martyrdom. I do actually pray for him that he will do that. And not only for his own sake, but for the sake of all those poor people who are following him as seemingly so blindly. Um, their souls depend upon this too. Yeah, they, they, but in any case, uh, what I'm praying for... Francis and all of them is that they, re, they, 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 their faith be restored, the traditional Catholic faith be restored in them, and that they, they return to the practice of the traditional Catholic religion. In the Mass, the true Mass, the true sacraments, and all the rest that in, is involved in practicing the traditional Catholic faith. So, um, yes, in answer to that question, I, I do. Okay. Um, but... Uh, I pray for a lot of other things, too, of course. <laughs> I hope and so. praying for all of those who are practicing the Catholic faith, that, that they will be steadfast. Mm -hmm. So I have confidence in that. Well, Father, thank you for being here tonight. This has been a very uh, enlightening program, I believe. I, and I hope so, Tom. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks to our listeners. Yep. Yeah, thanks for your support. We certainly appreciate that. Mm -hmm. You know, for all of those who are willing to sacrifice for the program and financially support, there is Mass. I offer Mass every single month. 
specifically, uniquely for your intentions. So uh, I want you to know that that is an act of gratitude, sincere gratitude for your support. Definitely. Well, thanks to all our viewers for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you and God bless you.